Susan Davis of BRAC USA, man, I, the book is fantastic. Everything about what BRAC does is, is tremendous, and there's so much we could go over. But we've got to go over the book, though, Social Enterprise. You wrote the book on it. What is it? <laughs> well, David Bornstein and I co-authored oh, yeah. um, Social <laughs> Entrepreneurship, What Everyone Needs to Know. And it's an Oxford University Press series, What Everyone Needs to Know About Some Big Important Topic. Islam, Kosovo, and they thought finally social entrepreneurship had arrived as an important topic that everybody should know about. Folks who are in business, in government, uh, in academia, uh, young people who are trying to figure out what to do with their, their lives, um, older folks who are thinking about a third career, or mid-career folks who are tired of the rat race and the burnout and want to have greater meaning in their lives. So social entrepreneurship is a way to use the entrepreneurial drives and talent and um, uh, industry disrupting uh, innovative techniques and apply it to solving social problems. That's it in a nutshell. Mm. And if we tried to reinvent the way business happens, we wouldn't maybe need social entrepreneurship, but we don't have enough um, enough healthy kids um, or healthy food chains um, or a pollution-free environment yet. So that's part of why we're, we're having to look at the intersection between um, what civil society does in the social realm, what business does in the economic realm, what government does in the policy realm, and see if we can't do a mashup and produce something better for all of us. And we're going to talk about how it's working because it's what you do with, with BRAC USA, but, uh, but, but even before we get there, um, social enterprise itself, is, is there um, kind of a movement or a merger of social enterprise and traditional business? Is it moving closer together? I think so. I, I think that um, in the early days, uh, corporate social responsibility was maybe a lot of you know, greenwashing, bluewashing, um, uh, PR stuff. Um, but now so many more corporations have taken the challenge much more seriously, whether pushed by consumers, internally by champions who are employees or to be better recruiters, or just the passion and commitment of people who who uh, have private firms and don't have to answer to that, you know, short-term quarterly return dynamic. So. Um, you've got more sincere efforts out of the uh, for-profit traditional business sector. Also, you have more creative approaches from civil society, where traditionally maybe the activists just stood on the fringes and protested and shouted about finger-pointed. Um, now people are trying to lead by example and just get in there and do it. And and BRAC, you know, has a 40-year track record mm -hmm. of of doing it, of showing an alternative way. So this is the place of great um, joy and optimism, constructing the alternative. And if you can do it in partnership, even better. Well, let's get specific then. Okay. Um, as as you, you, you mentioned, it's 40 years now for, for BRAC, and that's tremendous. Something that you have focused on for years, though, has been women's development. I mean, it's half the population. Women's development in many, many things. Where this year is BRAC USA going? Hmm. The reason that uh, BRAC focuses on women is because we believe uh, women are the catalyst for change in their families, in their communities, and ultimately um, countries. We, we think um, women have had a raw deal, um, and we're um, often um, real victims of violence, um, but of discrimination and subordination um, by the, the institutions we've created. And, and women oppress other women. You know, mother-in-laws are the front line of the, the, the oppressors and of young girls in Bangladesh. Cause when I you, have a tremendous mother-in-law. <laughs> <just wanted to, laughs> so that's part of, uh, you know, it's not that it's all men are bad, all women are good. It's, um, it's structures of the way we create families and communities and societies in our economy. Mm -hmm. So let's face it, women's labor has subsidized the economy. Yeah. What we do, our traditional work of giving birth to children, raising and caring for children in the family, of being able to, to uh, make sure that um, food is on the table, that water is collected and there, all of that means that women are the shock absorbers 
for social change for society. Um, it's both um, an opportunity and a situation of great injustice. So in trying to right that situation, we have focused in on the fact that women need to have economic empowerment in order to break free of some of the social uh, injustice. Women need um, not only to do more work, because we're working hard enough, um, we need to be able to have more say in voice in how the, how the money gets spent. Mm -hmm. So for the first time, a woman will actually have money in her hands when she borrows uh, a microloan. And we've got probably 8 million customers in Bangladesh and 10 other countries in Asia and Africa right now. Now, she may not use all of that money herself. Her family may be involved in her business. Uh, we think that's fine. The ability to learn how to handle money, to invest it, to budget it, to spend it, to save it, all of these are key skills. And if we can teach young children, boys and girls, early on how to do that, we will prevent poor old ladies. So whether it's mainstreaming financial education in schools or being able to have special programs for teenage girls um, where they learn financial literacy and life skills and then get access to trying out a little business themselves. That's all part of a strategy to socially and economically empower the group of society right now that needs that kind of empowerment. And in the process, what we're trying to do is make sure we're talking with men and boys and bringing them into the process so that they get a better deal. Because for far too long, men have been denied the joy of being full parents and full human beings. And that's starting to change now, too. Well, my goodness, that, is, that certainly is an awful lot, but what it really, it seems like it was interesting that when we started talking about rights and women's development, the very first thing you talked about was economic empowerment. Is that the key? Absolutely. Right now, um, women need to be able to have uh, access and ownership to land, mm -hmm. so property rights is key. Um, to be able to claim their full inheritance rights um, when they need it. They need to be able to have access to capital, and if they don't have any collateral, um, you can't usually get there unless there's innovative microfinance. They need a safe place to save their money. Um, women are notoriously savers for that rainy day, whether it was a handful of rice, you know, put away, mushti chal tradition. Mm -hmm. But often uh, there isn't a safe place. And so that whole range of economic empowerment um, activities, BRAC is very much involved in that in not only Bangladesh, but um, now touching the lives of three million Ugandans with the help of our MasterCard Foundation in Tanzania, another couple of million people. And all of this is built on a foundation of access to, to credit and savings and, and most importantly, understanding, literacy. How, how have the men who have been in power, real power for ever in those countries, how are they reacting to powerful women? Mm -hmm. Really well. And that's part of the, um, I think, the win-win deal that happens in families. Um, one of my favorite stories is Hasina and Musharraf, uh, and you can see a video on our website in the Courage in the Heart mm -hmm. series. We'll be sure and put that website up, by the way. So uh, it, it reminds me of that scene when Harry met Sally, uh, and they look over and say, I'll have what she's having. Mm -hmm. The villagers saw how happy they were and decided maybe uh, Musharraf's not getting such a bad deal, and they, went, they wanted in on that action. So. Um, Families get out of poverty by working together. The majority are pooling resources, just the same way our families mm -hmm. probably do it. So right now, there needs to be enough opportunity. Um, we, we actually lend to men as well. Um, the majority of our customers are women, um, but we have many men who are taking out small loans for um, their businesses, usually a little bit larger business and their individual loan customers. We're also working now with uh, teenage boys and have done very interesting research to understand the perceptions of young men and women and what we can do to help them. What do you mean by that, but the perceptions? Well, uh, we've surveyed um, in Uganda, for example, a nationally representative survey of what a youth um, want, 
what's their attitudes towards education, to work, to society, um, you know, how do we um, ensure that they participate in creating the future uh, that, that they want. Um, this is not, you know, BRAC doing something for them. Um, this is about real engagement of people who are helping themselves. And so the one thing we listened, um, young men and women um, want more opportunity. So we're uh, in the process of creating a, a large scholarship program that will help the folks who fall off at primary school mm -hmm. be able to stay on that ladder of opportunity through secondary school and hopefully then university education. We're already doing that in Bangladesh successfully and want to be able to create the whole value chain so that there's a second chance for the poorest kids who who never got to school. It's key to do that in post-conflict countries like Sierra Leone, Liberia, South Sudan, or still at war for God's sakes in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and Pakistan. If not, they're going to be carrying guns again. You know, it's really interesting that you would say that because it's been 10 years ago I, I uh, interviewed uh, right here uh, actually a young woman who was a Nobel Peace Prize nominee mm. and she was from Colombia and she was talking about that very thing she said that if we don't have something for them to do the and she was talking about teenage boys will go back to carrying weapons and that was is kinda like the basis of, of my question and when I look at the conflicts around the world it seems that almost all of the pictures you see are of men or or boys carrying guns Yeah. Well, the, the, the imagery out of, um, out of Africa is, I, I think it's like pornography almost, um, poverty pornography where we, we stereotype um, young men as violent weapon carriers and, you know, we show starving picture, pictures of starving children and that's, um, that's manipulative um, communications that we don't need anymore. I think um, the U.S. public certainly needs a more sophisticated representation. And I am trying to create a bridge so that people involved in BRAC's work can speak directly to folks in the U.S. because um, we think things will change with that connection. So that's one point. Mm -hmm. But overall, um, in our experience, the majority of men and, and young, um, young folks, um, young boys in Africa that we're just five countries where we're working, they really are already working. Um, they are um, having a better opportunity usually to get um, uh, the jobs than their counter the girls. And that's why we bias our efforts to the girls. Um, mm -hmm. But both of them need help. They have better likelihood of staying in school if the parents have to pick which of the five children gets their education paid for. They put their money on that young man, and he has the burden of earning and, and re sending money home mm -hmm. to the family. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a big responsibility um, on their shoulders. Now, there are issues about how um, around sexual and reproductive health care. Um, where uh, we need to foster greater um, parental responsibility. And that's something that um, we learned through focus group discussions and our team on the ground is trying to engage men and boys around that conversation. How, how can we set up the support so that young men can have families and take care of the children they produce and feel good about their, their lives and their future, instead of having to run away from the responsibilities that they can't meet. Mm. It, doesn't, it doesn't make them feel good. They'd like a better, a better chance in life. And that's why ultimately what we're trying to do, it's like a teen dream program. How can you help teens realize their dreams? You got to have the financial empowerment with the social empowerment and educational opportunity. So we're very focused on job creation and educational opportunity creation. In uh, an economic circumstance around the world that has certainly had its difficulties, is um, financial empowerment for groups such as what you were just talking about, is that even possible now? Oh, yeah. The, um, right now, um, we're the largest provider of microfinance in Sierra Leone, um, in Liberia, um, in Uganda, in Tanzania. 
South Sudan's had had trouble. We became the largest, and right now um, the uh, that program is in trouble. It doesn't work always, everywhere, forever, um, but it is possible. And if you look at who's borrowing, because of the demographics of those countries, the vast majority of our customers are young people. They're under 30, mm -hmm. and what it is that people know how to do um, can be improved and what it is that they can, like lots of them are farmers, mm -hmm. right? Farmers and petty traders. So we've been trying to figure out how can we increase returns to their labor? Well, you want to have better seeds so that they can always germinate and can triple the yields with the application of some knowledge of simple like line sowing um, techniques rather than scatter sowing. Um, that makes a huge difference in being able to increase incomes. Hmm. You mentioned farming. I wanted to talk about the rural versus urban issues that are happening in what we call impact countries. We don't call them developing countries anymore. We call them impact countries. Um, and it seems though that like here in the United States, so many people are leaving the rural areas and going to the cities. The cities have to provide more services and that puts a huge burden on cities, especially in impact countries. Uh, is there a way for rural life to be appealable yet again? Well, um, if you look at the conditions people live in, in urban areas, um, it's uh, a, a much lesser, um, you know, quality of life. Um, it's cramped conditions, often slum communities. Um, it, it's hard. Uh, there's higher rates of violence often. Um, so. The countryside um, is a place where people often um, return to um, during rainy seasons. Um, we see that circular p migration pattern between Monrovia and Freetown in our programs in Liberia mm -hmm. and Sierra Leone. And because BRAC is so large, we have branches in the towns and in the urban, in the rural areas. Um, so that helps. Um, in terms of improving the quality of life in rural areas, it's about making sure that they have light. So we're now trying to market solar um, lanterns um, through innovative partnerships actually crafted here at the Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, we were just talking today with a, a new company about their, um, their product, Waka Waka in Tanzania, mm. which means um, uh, bright, shine bright. And that um, solar uh, lamp would last for probably 10, 20 years. It costs um, $10. Uh, it'll provide light for um, you know families um, with with natural lighting charging it, and it will make a huge difference between um, you know people being able to stay in the countryside with light or without. Same thing with water, hmm. um, with sanitation, basic things that can improve it, and then key the ability to earn. So if what you know how to do is to sew or to embroidery. If you can figure out how your product can get to a market in the urban area where th there's purchasing power, you can stay at home, have a, a nice larger homestead, you can probably grow your own vegetables and earn enough to take care of your family, but only if we can improve the, the basic standard of living through the na natural source of energy like solar, mm -hmm. um, better um, access to health care. Um, and the basics of water and sanitation. But the key is how will they earn a living to support mm -hmm. themselves and put food, uh, food on the table. And that's where microfinance comes in and the livelihood development um, initiatives where social enterprises can come in and be the, the large-scale aggregator um, like we've done in Bangladesh. We've created uh, the Bloomingdale's of Bangladesh are wrong with 12 retail outlets and we then provide work for 65,000 artisans that live in rural areas. Can you order online? Well, we're working on that. <laughs> is it Amazon so uh, shipping? It soon <laughs> it will be. Uh, our e-commerce initiative is, oh. is actually being developed right now. Um, but w interestingly, we catered to the domestic market in Bangladesh, the mm -hmm. upper class, middle class, made it fashionable for them to wear local silk and to buy uh, hand embroidered pillow cushions and bedspreads. And that's a more stable market than our very fickle um, export market. Mm -hmm. So that's also a key is 
create enterprises that can cater to the real needs, the goods and services that people in that country need. When you can find export opportunities, do that, but carefully, because mm -hmm. folks depend on, depend on those orders for their living, and our markets are very fickle. You know, so if I were to sum up this, and keeping it in economic terms, I would say that you're, you're pretty bullish on uh, development in impact countries. Oh, absolutely. I think uh, there is so much investment opportunity uh, for people with patient capital uh, and an appetite for taking on risk with very high rewards. Mm, all right, let's talk about the patient capital part. I would finish it right there, but we've got to talk about the patient capital. What do you mean by that? Can, can people get a 2 4 5% return possibly over a long period of time with uh, investment in impact countries? Well, it depends. Um, it depends on the currency. Um, you're asking for can we get a return in dollars? Mm -hmm. um, so that makes it a little more complicated because um, currency depreciation vis-a-vis -vis the dollar in a country like Uganda, you know, um, took a real beating over the last uh, ten, five, ten years. Over the long haul, maybe. Um, right now, Bangladesh has currency controls, um, so they don't allow their hard-earned foreign exchange to flow out. Um, but if you are patient and you want to be creative, you can actually use what we know now to, to, to layer different levels of capital for different levels of risk. We call it a waterfall. Um, and we do that in ingenious ways so that we can use grant funding to take the first loss layer. We can use investors who want maybe a 3% return to take the next layer, and investors who want the 5 to 7 to 8% to take the next layer, and creatively wrap that. And that's what these ingenious um, social investors are being able to do so that you can get returns. It's early stage for being able to do it in the countries um, that we're working in because you don't have currency hedges available and uh, they really are pretty risky places. Um, but the returns are going to be greatest in terms of social impact. And if you care about that, your 3% return you know, that you get in your money market, you know, that, that looks great today um, for folks in America because we only earn maybe less than 1%. If you think about the long-term returns to being able to really invest in creating cultures of peace, in real peace, that means we've got to have enough good work for everybody who needs it on the planet. And that is the biggest payoff. If you want your kids to live in a peaceful country with a chance that we're going to survive all of the, all of the challenges facing us, we've got to invest now as much as possible in real relationships that will endure their business, their social, political, but you got to be in it for the long haul. Susan Brack, USA. Thank you very much. Thank you.